He is a best-selling writer, director. He is a filmmaker. His best-selling books are Flipside, which is a tourist guide to how to navigate the afterlife. And it's a wonderful afterlife, further adventures on the flip side. Please welcome Richard Martini as he tells us how examining the NDE can give you insight into having more fun in life. That was excellent. That's very good. Sold it. So the uh, subject of my talk today, and thank you so much for having me. This is uh, really an honor for me, and I really appreciate it. Um, but the subject of today's talk is near life experiences. The other day I came across this wonderful book by um, Ed Kelly at the University of Virginia. It's called Beyond Physicalism. And Ed is a scientist who works with Bruce Grayson, one of the founders of this August organization. And his book is a follow-up to the book that they did before, um, Irreducible Mind. And it's a very dense uh, piece of work about the science behind consciousness. Being a layman, somebody who grew up in Chicago, somebody who fell into the film business, fell, fell, into, fell into my life, um, just a little bit about me and how I came to admire Ed Kelly's work, which I'm going to quote from today a little bit. But basically, I grew up outside of Chicago. Um, my journey to, where, to this podium today really began about 16 years ago when a close friend of mine passed away and came to visit me. And I had that profound experience of seeing my friend, not as I knew her, but as a younger version of herself. And she was taking me on the journey with her at some point. I felt myself sort of traveling through a volcano, actually. I could see that the walls were red, and I could hear this intense roaring sound. And I wasn't aware of her being with me. I was just aware of this incredible mystical experience. And she said, isn't this fucking amazing? <laughs> and I recognized her voice, but it was her when she was in her 20s. She had been an actress, so I've heard her voice when she was in her 20s, but I didn't meet her until she was in her 30s. And then after that, I had a, another experience when I was working in New York City on the Charles Grodin Show. I was helping produce segments for his program. I'm a writer-director. I've written and or directed eight theatrical films, none of which you've seen. But I can tell you, in Trump logic, they're all great. They're all fantastic. They're the best films that were ever made. Um, but anyway, and so while I was working on his show, I had a, a, uh, an OBE. How many are familiar with the term? Everyone is. I'd had a few when I was in college, floating around the room sort of things. Just dismissed it. But in this case, I felt myself rocket out of my body into deep space. And I saw Manhattan disappear in my eye, my visual. It's like I look back, almost like that film Powers of Ten. And I was aware, consciously aware, that I was hurtling through deep space. And at some point, I took a turn, suddenly like a right-handed turn. And I was now hurtling in that direction. And it felt like I was tumbling through deep space, and then I I went into what I can only describe the feeling of as an alternate universe, another universe. Looking back on it, I would say, well, it felt like I went through a black hole. I don't know what I went through, but I was now traveling this way instead of that way. And I came to a full stop, and there was my friend, Luana Anders, this actress, with her eyes closed. And she opened them and looked at me, as if to say, you were wondering where I was. Here's where I am. And as I was trying to get my mind around what I was experiencing, suddenly some guy outside my apartment in New York honked his truck horn. And I came hurtling back to Earth. But before he took his hand off the horn, I experienced that return trip. Manhattan coming up at me at this great rate of speed. And suddenly, boom, I'm in my room. Like anyone else, I was skeptical of what just happened. I put it aside. What the heck was that? If 
people still exist in the afterlife, can we go visit them? And do we need a spacesuit in order to do so? Or is there some other mode of transport? That was my kind of dim thought. Now, my friend Luana had been a Buddhist, so I found that Robert Thurman was teaching a class in Tibetan philosophy, Columbia University, so I took this class with him. You're familiar with Robert. He's Uma Thurman's father. He's the head of Tibetan studies at Columbia University. And I thought, you know, Buddhism. She was a Buddhist. Maybe there's something in there, Tibetan Book of the Dead, that says, we go to another planet somewhere, and you can visit those people. I just thought, you know, study it. And I spent a number of years studying Tibetan philosophy, learning about it, made some films in India and Tibet. And I found that it didn't have what ex I experienced. And for those familiar with Tibetan philosophy, the bardo of the dead is where we eventually end up. But once we get there, we're like what they call a clear light, like a wisp of smoke. No consciousness, just a wisp of smoke that travels to the next lifetime based on karma based on actions that you've done throughout your life. That wasn't my experience. My experience was being over there, but fully conscious. So I thought, well, that's not exactly what I'm looking for. And through a weird confluence of events, which I talk about in my books, I met an uh, Oxford professor, Robert Beer, who, when I shook his hand in London, I had that weird feeling we sometimes have where their voice goes off in your head, and it says, this is who you're supposed to meet. I thought that was odd. It's a friend of a friend. Shook his hand, and you know we started conversing back and forth. Six months later, his daughter passed away suddenly in a tragic accident. I felt terrible for him, and I wrote him some letters trying to console him, and I had just been looking at Carol Bowman's book, Children's Past Lives. And I thought, you know, maybe this will be of some solace to him. And he said, you know, you should check out the work of Michael Newton. So at that point, I looked up Michael Newton's work and read his books. And in the first chapter, there was an identical description of something that my friend Luana had said to me on her deathbed. One day, we're just having cappuccino, and she said, I get the feeling I'm going to another universe. I said, what makes you say that? She said, I have this recurring dream. I'm in a classroom, but it's in another place. And everyone's speaking a language I don't understand, but I somehow do understand. And they're talking about spiritual things. I thought, oh, well, that's the, you know, that's the drip. <laughs> that's the morphine drip, you know, that they've given her. Um, and then when she passed away, a close friend of hers called me and said, I had the most amazing dream about Luana last night. She was in the fourth dimension, she said, in a classroom. And everyone was dressed in white, which she had also said. Everyone dressed in white. And I started thinking, Cla classrooms in the afterlife? What? Uh, and then the nurse, I mentioned it to the nurse, the hospice nurse, who said, oh, that was her dream. That was the recurring dream that she had, classrooms in the afterlife. And now, here it is. Two years later, I'm opening up this book. There's one of Michael Newton's cases talking about visiting a classroom in the afterlife where everyone was dressed in white. A you know, bell went off in my head, and I said, well, this is what you should be researching. So I contacted the Newton Institute, said, can I interview Michael? No, he's retired. Well, can I come to your conference or something and interview people? Sure, come to our conference. Bring your cameras. So I went off to Chicago, my hometown, and I started to interview people that were doing this kind of work. Are you familiar with this work? It's, it's deep hypnosis. It's four to six hour sessions of people under deep hypnosis, basically recounting the same things about the journey of souls. Like anyone, I assumed that he must be manipulating them in some way or guiding them, or how could all these people that he was seeing who had never met each other be saying the same thing about the journey of souls? Okay. So I asked if I could interview Newton, and after he met me, he said, sure, I'll give you my last interview. And in the interview, he said, look, I was a skeptic. I didn't believe in past life regression at all until 
a client spontaneously remembered a lifetime in World War I where he had died in a trench being stabbed by a German soldier. And Newton, the skeptic, had said to him, really, what's your mother's maiden name? What street did you grow up on? What unit are you from? And afterwards, unbeknownst to the client, he sent to the British War Office these details. This guy was in the Fourth Corps. They wrote him back and said, yes, this was the name of this guy. He died in 1916 in the Battle of the Somme. As Newton says, that opened up his practice to past life regressions. And then somewhere in the 60s, I'm getting to near life experiences. <laughs> We're getting there, following this thread. Somewhere in the 60s, a woman came in very depressed. And, and as Newton put it, it didn't matter to him whether these people were really remembering past lives or not because they were being effectively cured. The guy who had the shoulder problem was the guy who got stabbed by a, uh, by a soldier. And, and the next day, his wife said, called Newton to say thank you because my, wife's, uh, my husband's shoulder is cured. So Newton, as he put it, as many hypnotherapists I've spoken to have put it, they're not really that concerned with the details. They're just concerned with the outcome. But me, I'm a little more concerned with how do we get to this process? So this woman came into his office and she said, I'm very depressed, I'm lonely, I don't know why I'm here on the planet, I feel really, I, I just don't wanna be here. So under hypnosis, he said, take me to the source of your pain, especially if there's a group involved, other people. And she said, oh, I see, they're all in your office right now. They're all my friends that I normally incarnate with. I recognize them all, and we agreed in this life we wouldn't be together. Oh, I see. Okay, thank you very much. I'm okay now. And Newton <laughs> said, what? Where are these people? Is this in the past? Is this in the future? She said, no, this is now. I'm accessing them now in the between lives realm, she said. So Newton basically closed his practice for the next 30 years. 7,000 clients took him to that place. He cataloged it privately, quietly, published in 1994, Journey of Souls. And his three books are about his work in that area. So like I say, I'm now have arrived in Chicago. I'm filming these sessions, and I'm, my mouth is agape because people are remembering dying in the Holocaust. They're remembering such details that I can verify them, find the names of their families, and find out who they are. They're talking about why they chose lifetimes that were so difficult. And then at the end of this week of me filming these people, they turned to me and said, well, Rich, what about you? You wanna do one of these? And I thought, well, uh, I can't be objective if I do. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute, I can prove this is fake. Because I'm not trying to be cured. I'm not here to, and this is the problem, Dr. Grayson, as he mentioned to me, the problem with hypnosis is a valid scientific tool is because people want to be cured. They go see a, the hypnotist to be cured, and the hypnotist wants to cure them. So you have a real problem with them, to, who's guiding who to the truth, you see? But in this case, I, I don't want to be cured, <laughs> that I'm aware of. I'm just here to find out the truth, okay. And beyond that, if he tries to guide me anywhere, I'm not going. If he says, where are we? I'm gonna say, I'm not anywhere until he stops asking a question. That's what I said to myself. And then just before I left, it was like, oh, that's right. People uh, ask questions if they get somewhere. I'll, I'll, I'll sketch a few questions out. It was really two in the morning, my mom's house in Chicago. I wrote down 10 questions. What is, what is, what did this mean? This weird thing happened to me, blah, 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 blah. So now we get to Jimmy Quast was the hypnotherapist. He's out of Maryland. Gee, Rich, you know, what do you, where do you want to go? So I, we go back into my lifetime and I, I'm remembering things back when I was 10 or 12 years old and it was interesting because I could feel the emotion of the memory. I cut my hand and I remember seeing my father come out of the garage with bandages and that emotion of feeling, oh, dad's here, dad's gonna cure me. And I thought, well, that's weird. So I, I, obviously that's in my head somewhere, that 12 year old emotion, and I'm accessing it. So now we go earlier, 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 and we get to your first memory. Let's go to your first memory. And I saw myself being born, but from the point of view, coming out. And I saw myself being held up 
the way they used to do that, you know, hold you up by the feet and smack you. But I was looking at the doctor from this perspective. You know, I could see his hazel eyes and I could see that goofy thing on his head and the mask. But I clearly see his eyes as I can see them right now. And he's looking at me. <laughs> I don't know what he's thinking, like, why isn't he breathing? I don't know. But I experienced that. And I said, look, my, f my father's not here, but he's on his way here. Now, that was a detail I didn't know. It turned out to be true. I asked my mother about it. All right, you with me? So now I'm experiencing this, so I'm in, I'm in the world. It's like I took the red pill. I'm in the world that I didn't think I would go to. Ultimately, he, they say, let's go to a previous lifetime that has some significance to this one. And in my mind's eye, I'm traveling through nowhere. You know, it's dark. I don't see anything. What do you see? Nothing. Okay, look around you. What do you see? I don't see anything. I was going to say that for four hours. And then he said, just look down. I saw my feet uh, cut up and in a creek. And then he said, so what are you wearing? And as I pulled back, I could see this Native American Indian. Consciously, I went, oh, come on, Rich. Really? That's what you're making up? You're an American Indian. That's good, buddy. Got a conscious mind mocking me as I'm speaking. I said, I'm a Lakota Sioux, and I'm a medicine man. And I said, my name is Watanka. My conscious mind said, oh, come on, you saw dances with wolves. Tatanka means buffalo. You can't even get the word buffalo right. You said, Watanka, what's the matter with you? Really? I'm like, conscious mind, take it easy. Then he says, well, let's go to your tribe. And I said, I can't. He said, why not? And then I saw they'd all been wiped out, all murdered, all dead, all massacred, blood everywhere, smoke. I saw myself, I felt a teepee. I held, opened this door. I looked down and I saw a woman, black hair. Her throat had been cut. And I said, they've killed my wife and they've taken my son. The depth of the emotion of that sentence, I've never experienced in this life, but I felt it. And consciously I thought, what are you doing? Why would you create this? This is the most painful experience you've ever had in any lifetime. Why would you create this? He said, so what happened to your tribe? I said, it was the fucking Huron. I said, and consciously, Huron, they're in upstate New York. They're in Canada. This is like, this has got to be Montana. You're all over the map, buddy. And then at some point, we got to... And by the way, six months later, I'm at a funeral in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. I'm with my cousins. I asked my cousin what he's doing for a living these days. He says, I'm a historian for the Lakota. How did you get that job? He explained to me. I said, well, uh, let me just tell you this weird thing that happened to me. And he's, I, he said, well, wait, don't tell me anything. Just what were you wearing? I said, buckskin. He said, did you have any feathers? I said, yeah, two. He said, were they up? Or were they down? I said, they were down. They were in my hair. He said, well, that means you were a medicine man. Uh, okay. Um, what about this name, Watanka? He said, that's what they called their medicine men, Wakantanka. It means the great spirit. It's a derivative of Wakantanka. You were a medicine man. Uh, okay. I said, what about the Huron? I said this thing about the Huron. He said, dude, you're sitting in the spot, Eau Claire, Wisconsin. They fought for 60 years. None of those things are cryptomnesia. None of those things can be looked up online. I know, I tried. Only if you spoke to a historian from the Lakota Sioux would you find these facts to be true. The point is, it's new information to me. It's not accessible to me on any part of the plane or the planet. And I'm getting to the point, which is, the hypnotherapist says, now where do you want to go? And I said, he said, let's go to the last day of this lifetime. And I saw myself as a shell of a person, a drunken old man carrying an empty bottle of whiskey, standing on a riverbank. He said, where are we? I said, we're at this muddy river, and I'm going to kill myself here. And I step into the water, and I see myself, Bob, down the river. And he said, oh, I'm so sorry. And I said, I'm not. They took everything from me. 
my wife, my children, my son, my religion, my people. I'm a shell of a human being. I just want to go home. And as I said it, I thought, what? Home. Home. What? Where's home? What does he mean? What do I mean? And that's really the subject of today's talk, which is I've filmed 35 people, and when they get to that last day of the previous lifetime that they remember, they say the same thing, roughly. I want to go home. I'm done here. I want to go home. Home implying is not here. I mean, this is not home. Let's call it that. We can call it the stage that we're on. We can call it the imperfect earth that we inhabit. What they're talking about is not home. They're talking about home. So that was, those were stories that I put in the book Flipside, and when I presented it to Dr. Grayson, he was aptly pointed out that hypnosis isn't something that science uses. So I started looking at near-death experiences because that is something science has acknowledged and, and examined. And then I thought, wait a second, why don't I talk to people who had a near-death experience, like David Bennett, who's sitting up here, and see if they've ever had a between-life session where they could examine what happened during their near-death experience. The premise being this. Everything, that, the recorder that is our brain records everything. There's no delete key. There's no pause key, even while we're sleeping. As we know, everything's recorded. Your dreams, everything. We come to consciousness, we may, may not be able to access it, but it's there somewhere. As we know, if you put a pin somewhere in somebody's engram of a brain memory, they'll, they'll remember it and the emotion and everything about it. It's all there. And as some people point out, it appears to be elsewhere as well. Consciousness, your memory, your previous lifetimes, that's another topic, but to stay with this topic, let's just go with that. So if you had a near-death experience, it's still there. It's still accessible. And depending who you work with, and I think it's really important to find a hypnotherapist who can work with you and ask you the right questions. Where are we? What are we doing here? You don't have to feel upset about this experience. You can hover above it. But let's go to beyond the accident or the incident. Let's go into another part of your consciousness and see who's here. And because I work with so many Michael Newton trained people, they're used to seeing people in the room who are your spirit guides, who are people that can, are friends of yours from your soul group. They kind of know the architecture of the afterlife. So they can help guide you by asking you relatively neutral questions. Where would you like to go? Would you like to, can we go talk to somebody who has the answers to your questions at some point? And in my own case, yes, I did get to a point where I went to ask a group questions about Rich Martini. <laughs> and I had that odd thing of I'm a, exactly like this, standing at a podium in front of a table of about eight and behind other people who I, I couldn't see who they were, but I was aware that they were there. And these eight people, I was aware that I've known them forever. And so I'm asking them questions that I have written out the night before willy-nilly. The hypnotherapist says, would you like me to read the questions? And I said, it's OK. I've already asked them. As if, because my brain had the memory of writing it down, I could ask them these 10 questions in order. And they were answering them. And one of the most important questions, I think, for us is, why did you choose Rich Martini? Because they say in these sessions, we choose who we are. We choose our lifetimes for a reason. There's a theme. There's a beginning, middle, and an end to every play. There's a beginning, middle, and an end to every life. Every play has a theme. Every life has a theme. Aristotle's words still apply to the life journey, which is that out of conflict 
comes drama. That's in Poetics. He was saying it's not an interesting play <laughs> unless there's conflict. So if you just allow that for a second, that we're here, we choose our lifetimes, and we're here, and we choose who we're going to be, and we choose the theme of our life. And so, again, I'm in this chair answering these questions, coming from this point of view of a filmmaker saying, I don't believe this is we're going to get anywhere, but now I'm asking the question, why did I choose Rich? And the answer was, every thought, action, word, or deed contains energy. Every thing that you sing, every book you write, every person, every time you write the ledger, every time you write a check, some part of your energy is in that act. Hard to measure, but it's there. And you can heal people with that energy. Your life choice, Rich, was as a filmmaker. Because you had this wacky idea that you were going to heal people with film. And I said, comedy, which is kind of the metier I've worked in, which is basically when you guffaw, you change a person's disposition instantly. There's no doctor that's in the room, but if they're laughing in a movie theater, they're going to feel better. I said, tears work equally, but they require catharsis. A Greek word I've never used in a sentence, but I was able to access it then. And I understood it, to go through that process. And then I said, you know, I just wish I had chosen somebody more successful. <laughs> and, I, and I got a laugh from, you know, my, the counsel and the, and the hypnotherapist. So I had this weird experience of having laughs simultaneously in two different planes at the same time. Okay. Now, as we know, when somebody tells you their story about who they are and what they did and what their experience is, we, you know, science has a tendency to look at it as anecdotal a word they use to, a very Trump-like word, to minimize what people are saying, either because it offends them or it hurts their feelings or they're not sure how to deal with it. But if you get 100 anecdotes of people's experiences and compare them and they're identical, relatively, we'll talk about that in a second, but the experiences are identical, you no longer have anecdotal information. You have data. It's a data set. And you keep following that along. You have thousands of people saying relatively the same things about the journey of life and the journey of souls and why we choose our lifetimes and why we're here and why experiences happen to us. And further, we can now, we you look at Dr. Grayson's scale of NDEs, what do we talk about? You talk about people who find themselves moving through sometimes traveling in through space. We find the same things in, in the between life sessions between out of body experiences. And then eventually they find some kind of a threshold, which might be light. Usually it's light. If you ask people about what it felt like while you were in the threshold, David Bennett even said this, it's a feeling of love. There's a love feeling that once you go through or are part of this threshold, but not just any love unconditional love, which is a funny thing when I hear it because it's not a term we use. They don't use it in commercials. You know, it's not something we hear. It's not a common phrase, but people use it all the time as if it was, but only when they're talking about this stuff. I had this feeling of unconditional love. I mean, what's, what is unconditional love? PMH Atwater and I were talking about this. She said, well, it's the love of nothing. You know, the love, there is no object, she said. I said, oh, hang on, hang on a second. First examine what's the opposite of unconditional love. What's that? Conditional love. I will love you if you build a wall for me. I will love you if you love me. The moment you stop loving me as much as I want you to love me, yeah, you know, maybe it's time for you to move along. That's not unconditional love. Unconditional love we find in many animal species. We find it in humans between mothers and children, usually. Not always, as we know, but sometimes. That's the term. I love my son unconditionally. I don't care if he's a mass murderer. I still love my son. Buddhism talks about it, the, the, the mother's love. Dalai Lama mentions it quite often. That idea, it's unconditional love. During one of the sessions that I did where I filmed, I brought a filmmaker in 
total skeptic. She said, Rich, I don't believe a word you're saying. I don't believe there's an afterlife. I don't believe I can be under hypnosis. However, I have a tumor on my ovary, and so I've heard it's good to do hypnosis, and maybe that'll help post-operative care. So I'll do it. Okay, so we're driving out, and she's telling me this in the car. Okay, all right. Um, I'll tell you what, though. Do you have some questions to ask people if you get somewhere? I'm not going to get anywhere. What do I need questions for? And trust me, you may. All right, I'll give you three questions. Is the universe a machine? She had a science background. She thought that's a good question. The second one, I kind of influenced her. What's the meaning of the shift? And she was like, what are you talking about? I said, well, people talk about a shift in consciousness. And then her last question was, what or who is God? Great, great question. Let's ask, what or who is God? Let's see. So we get to this session, Scott Tatambo, I work with in Claremont, California, hypnotherapist trained by Michael Newton, who's quite good. Out of the 35 cases I brought them, they've all been 100% successful at past life memories and between life experiences. I just happen to think he's a virtuoso, but so we're, we're there with this friend. And uh, right away, she goes into a lifetime in Arizona in 1820. Uh, she's a cowboy uh, who like, takes over this town. I'm able to Google it while she's talking and find the name of the town and find the name of this family. It was very strange. And then she talks about how at the end of this guy's life, he had married some young girl, and then they went for a drive in the buckboard, and at some point, the girl said, why don't you get me some water? And then he got out of the thing and limped over to the water, and then she rode off in the buckboard, <laughs> leaving him there to die. And so now she goes through the death experience, you know, cranky and angry and, and upset, and now we get to the point where she's, now we're going to ask. So Scott asked, what's, what's the next step? What happened? She said, I see myself step out of this body. And I'm this young spirit. I'm like a young girl. And he says, what's your emotion? How do you feel? And she says, I feel like I've always wanted to be a cranky old man, and I finally did it. <laughs> what? And then she says, oh, now I'm back with my soul group she says. And this is a common thing. People anywhere from 3 to 25, Newton says in his work, but generally in my observation of people I've talked to, there's a group of people that you know in your lifetime when you meet them, oh, I've known you forever. And generally, that group, might be a dozen, might be more, might be less, are people that you find in your soul group. Sometimes you're surprised that you find that person you thought you hated, but they played that role of the nasty uncle for a reason. But anyway, in this case, she finds all of her soul group. There's five other people. They're all young people. And she said, oh, they're so annoying. They're running around. It's driving me crazy. I can't really focus on them. Scott says, well, what are they doing? She says, well, they're playing tag. They're playing tag. It's, not, it's like this, there's a classroom in the afterlife. Really? They're playing tag in the afterlife. Really? He says, well, describe the game. How, does he, how do you play his tag? And she says, well, it's more like a cosmic tag. You can hide. You can turn invisible, and you can hide anywhere in the universe. And you have to capture all six at the same time in order to win. She said, ah, but there's a twist. You can be in any realm. You know, as you hear these things, you think, like anyone, like, what? My feeling is always just put it down, look at it, think about it, meditate it on it, meditate on it. What is this? And I realize this is like the way a search engine works. You know, you're looking for ones and O's of a particular form set. And you can search throughout the known universe to find them. And that's what they're doing, putting themselves out to find cosmic tag. Okay, I know it sounds loopy, but... That's, this is what she described. And then at some point we got to a library. And I'm sure you've all heard the term Akashic Records. Um, Akashic just being a Sanskrit word, really, for library. And ultimately, every time I've come across this term or this expression of a library, it's not a library that anybody says is the same. You see what I'm saying? There are libraries. 
We can all agree what a library is, but no one sees the same library. It's just like the word home. All these people said they wanted to go home. Well, none of us in this room could agree what home is. We can agree what the feeling is of what it's like being home, being loved unconditionally or being relaxed or whatever, most of us, right? So these libraries are always different. Some people describe books, some people describe scrolls, some people describe... One guy recently said that when he was going through his past lives, he was going through a card file of microfiche. And as he was planning his next lifetime, he was looking at the microfiche to see what elements had he missed out on those lifetimes that he could combine in this new lifetime. He said that when he decided to present the case for his new life, it was like doing a doctoral thesis, standing on stage, lecturing to these people in the audience who were not arguing with him, but were asking cogent questions. How do you feel that joining the military is going to be helpful for to you in this journey? And he had all the answers. Now, that was his experience. This was something I filmed maybe a month ago. He's a therapist who lives in Ventura County. It's the transcript appears on my next book. It's called Hacking the Afterlife, which just came out this week. But in this session, he talks about his life planning session because I wanted to examine that. What is a life planning session? So my point about near life experiences is this. We're here on stage. Thank you, by the way, for all being on my stage with me. <laughs> or, you know, I'm on your stage with you, and here we are on this stage. It just happens to be in Orlando at this moment, in the space and time. Here we are, all in our costumes that we chose, all in the characters that we chose. Wonderful choices. It takes courage to get on stage. Don't let anybody kid you. People are here and they feel like they shouldn't be here. People have near-death experiences and they come back. It's, it's, you know, they get up there and Jesus says, uh, it's not your time. He's saying, get back on stage. Not everybody wants to get back on stage because it's a lot of work being on stage. It takes courage to be on stage. It takes courage to go through all the stuff that we go through to be here. But make no mistake, it's a stage. So don't let things that put other people down make you or allow yourself to get so caught up in what their reality is. They have a whole script that you haven't seen. You can't see. I mean, it's important to remember that everybody has their own script. It's not written out like a screenplay. And I've written many screenplays. And what is a screenplay other than a blueprint for a life? Blueprint for a movie. My father was an architect. I grew up around blueprints. You know, I remember the day when he said, that's so-and-so's house down the block. That thing is his house? Oh, I see. It was in his mind, put it on paper, it became that. My mother was a concert pianist. I bought her the score for the Rachmaninoff Three. Very difficult piano piece. On the way home from the bookstore, downtown Chicago, she read it. And when we got home, she played it. Slowly, but she played it all the way through. As if she was remembering it. We're back there with our loved ones, plotting out who we're going to be. We have a blueprint. Now, what happens to blueprints? You know, look at Donald Trump. Here's a guy who goes around building buildings all over the place. He doesn't build them. He doesn't do anything. He puts his name on it. You have a blueprint. It gets approved. And then what do they do? They check out the weather. They check out the environment. They clear the land. They hire people. Somebody goes, I don't think we need to buy this gold leaf stuff. Let's just buy the bronze. It's cheaper. Uh, don't put all the electrical wires in it correctly. You know, that's how it goes. And then eventually you get this building that's like, oh, okay, but the elevator doesn't quite work. Some buildings just aren't that great. You know, they signed up to have a nice building, but it doesn't, <laughs> not all the buttons are working. And that's okay. That's okay. Inevitably, they'll, they'll figure out a way to make a new building. So, 
So when you examine near-death experiences and people talking about going to the other side, how many here have had a, an experience, uh, PMH Outwater was calling them awakenings? That's where you suddenly feel like you're connected to everyone on the planet? Has anybody had that experience? Okay, a few, quite a few. Okay, my wife had it, walking down the street one day, Santa Monica, and suddenly she felt connected to everyone and all people. I've been writing about this, or at least researching it. Uh, Sir Francis Young Husband, 1906. He was the British explorer who decided to invade Tibet, killed thousands of Tibetans on his way to Lhasa, where he was the first soldier to enter Lhasa, the forbidden city. And the 13th Dalai Lama escaped and left this monk behind, a guy named Thay Rinpoche, who basically said, who are you? Why are you killing us? What do you want? And there was a whole thing, well, we, we need to sell tea. You know, you're buying your tea from China, and we want you to sell, buy tea from the British plantations at Darjeeling. You've killed thousands of people to come here. Why? And Thay Rinpoche gave him a statue of Buddha. And he said, I have been praying in front of the statue my entire life, every day. I give it to you as a gift. So when you look upon it, you think of us Tibetans as humans. And young husband said, we're here to liberate you, to give you, bring you spirituality. That's what he said. He was talking about Christianity. The Rinpoche said, we've seen how you treat your animals. You have no spirituality in you. Wow burn, <laughs> epic burn from the Rinpoche. I was writing a screenplay about this, and I went to London, and I went to the Geographic Museum, and I went downstairs, and I found that statue in a box, hidden away. And I asked the curator, could we bring the statue out? Sure. We put out that little statue of Buddha, about six inches tall, some votive glasses made from jade that were so polished you could see clearly through them, and a giant bell, you know, Tibetan bell, you know, like school bell. And I said, can I ring the bell? That bell has been unrung for 100 years. Do you mind? Curator said, no, go ahead. <laughs> I picked up the bell, rang it, and the handle broke, and the bell fell and bounced in between each glass and <laughs> fell into the trash bin. So. Needless to say, I was red-faced. You should have seen the look on the face of the curator, and I apologized profusely and got the hell out of there. <laughs> Point of the story is, as young husband was carrying that statue away from Lhasa, he says in his book, I turned and suddenly all the golden roofs of Lhasa melted together, and I saw that we were all connected as humans, and I felt unconditional love for everyone and at that moment vowed to never pick up a rifle again, and he founded the Council of World Religions, which still exists to this day. The idea of unconditional love, you hear it over and over again in these, and I wrote it down, extrovertive mystical experiences, EMEs, which Dr. Kelly, I mentioned at the beginning, talks about in his book. These EMEs are highlights of what it's like back home. You get an experience of what it's like home in the afterlife. Almost all NDEs, of course, some people do have that experience of, of negativity before they end up getting anywhere, or maybe they don't go much further than that negativity. We know those experiences. We've heard them. But ultimately, I hear more often than not about unconditional love. Dr. Alexander talks about seeing people dancing. In some of the between life sessions that I've done, people play music or hear music. David Bennett's case, he was able to hear this profound music. Beethoven used to talk about that he used to gather music from the spheres. That's why, that was the, the genesis of his creativity, was opening himself up to the great beyond to channel that music. Eh, you know, is somebody composing it for him? I, I don't know. All I can say is you have these sensations over there that we don't really experience here. We don't really have them. 
other than in these odd times. A near-death experience, a between-life session, perhaps, out-of-body experiences sometimes, and then I come to the third part, which is uh, something that, that happened to me recently in the past year, and I write about it in Hacking the Afterlife, and that was this third discipline that I thought I would examine, or I don't know, is it fourth? Whatever. I got a call from a medium who said, I've read your, your books, and I'd like to work with you. And I said, ah, you know, that's okay. <laughs> Thanks. I mean, m mediums predict the future, mostly. They tell you who your soulmate is. I said, I'm, that's not my field. I mean, it's just not what I'm interested in. I don't think time is set the way some people do. I think time is always fluid because we have free will. So you can't predict the future, but you can predict lightly outcomes. And if it's a close-up outcome tomorrow, the next day, maybe you'll get that right. But once you get beyond that, there's, as we know, it's not always 100%, as we know. And instead of trying to examine the percentage that's correct and not correct, they just said, you know, it's not my field. And she said, okay. I said, well, what do you do? She said, well, I help find missing persons. I work with the FBI. Really? Have you had any cases that I would know about? Yeah, she mentioned a few. She said, I work with Bill Bratton. He used to be the L.A. commissioner. Now he's the New York commissioner. Oh, all right. So what did you do then? She told me the story. I said, so you're basically you're accessing the afterlife for a few seconds, and then you interpret what's happening. She said, yeah, that's what I do. I said, all right, well, hold on a second. I've been working on Amelia Earhart's life story for the past 30 years. Can I come and interview her? How would you like to work on the most famous missing person case in history? She said, I'm in. So I took my camera down, and I filmed her for three hours. Now, mind you, I'm not kidding when I say I've been working for 30 years on this story, on the movie uh, Amelia, I worked, I was the, one of the chief historians. I've gathered over 5,000 photographs, 30 hours. I know more about her story than anyone I've met, including quite a few experts. And the, my point is not because, and you haven't heard me tell the story of Amelia Earhart, because I, at some point I had to let it go. I was trying to make a film, and it just didn't happen, honestly. But then... When I was working on this movie, Salt, back in 2008, I'm in the movie. Um, I drive Angelina Jolie out of Korea. And while I was working on the movie, a medium had lunch with me and said, I'd like to read you. And I said, you yeah, know, same thing. I'm not really. She said, no, it's what I do. So she threw her cards out, and she went, you're making a movie about Amelia Earhart. How'd you know that? Did you look me up? No. But then I took the opportunity to interview, you see? Questions that I knew some of the answers to that I knew nobody else does, like her love affair, her open marriage with her husband. They had an open, she had an open marriage. I know who her lover was. I know that it was a woman. I know that it was a painter. I know her name. These are details that I've been able to gather that aren't in public awareness. I'm not trying to out Amelia. It's okay because Amelia has given me permission, quote, unquote, Amelia. Later on, another medium, you're familiar with uh, channelingeric.com or at least Dr. Medhus, her son passed away, called her on the telephone, spoke to her. She was a skeptic, and after he called her, she started working with a medium and talking to her son. She posts these things. We became friends at a book conference. I said, you should interview Amelia Earhart. She said, we are on Tuesday. <laughs> I said, okay, can I supply the questions? So the construct is Dr. Meadows talking on Skype to a medium, talking to her son in the past life, who now has Amelia Earhart in the room. Okay, I understand how weird that sounds. But I've supplied the questions again. One, just one question. Who was the love of your life, and was it a painter? I already know the answer, but I know no one else does. The medium says she just sat up right she seemed to pull herself together, and she said, I don't want to rewrite my history. I'm very comfortable with my story as a head of a woman's movement. However, yes, the love of my life was a painter, and it was a woman. So to me, a confirmation, okay? That's all that is. Confirmation of that particular detail. Another question she answered uh, that I'm familiar with, 
that she was incarcerated and died on Saipan. I've been to Saipan. I've interviewed 15 people who saw her there. It's a whole other story. But Jennifer Schaefer, Dot com. Jennifer Schaefer is the one who now I'm interviewing and seeing how good she is at what she does. And now I'm directly talking to someone who can answer questions about Amelia Earhart's life in great detail. And I say, how did you die? Now, this is something I had guessed at, but I didn't have a physical detail. From over there, she said dysentery. I had heard that Fred Gurner, who wrote a book about it, that he had gotten that story from natives. So where are you buried? She said, I'm here. First she said, don't look for me because I'm, I'm alive. I still exist over on the flip side. Why, like, why do you care? What are you looking for bones for? But I said, what, what happened to your body? And she said, it's here on Saipan. And I went, no, come on, that doesn't make sense. She said, Two GIs dug me up. Now, that was in Gurner's book. Hanson and Burke dug her up. They interviewed these guys who said they were on Saipan and they had to dig her up. Okay? She said, but they only recovered my arm. And I said, what? That, where did, what? what is that? I don't understand. What do you mean they only got your arm? Because, she said, some islanders moved me. They didn't think they'd give me a proper burial. They moved to a more respectable place. I said, show me. Show me the place. The medium drew a map. I had just been there. She drew a map of the exact location. I knew exactly what she was talking about based on her map. <laughs> you're there? You're telling me you're still there? That's where you are? Yes. OK, so I left this meeting thinking it's my head swimming. Again, I'm not completely insane. I have a skeptical mind still working, doubting. How could that be? 10 minutes later, I'm driving away from her place in Manhattan Beach. Phone rings, and it's a federal investigator who has been doing tons of research in this field. This is a retired guy. Uh, and he says to me, Rich, I just went through this file, where it, which has all of these government documents that no one's seen before, and they confirm everything about your story. She, was a, she came down to Amelia Tolls. She was arrested. She was taken to Saipan. She was incarcerated. U.S. Marines found her plane, found her briefcase, destroyed her plane. And here's the weird thing. They dug her up, but they only found her arm. A new piece of information. Nothing that was in my mind after 30 years of research, nothing that was in the medium's mind, which could only come from one other place. And subsequently, since then, I found that evidence that those GIs were interviewed, 1977 Chicago Tribune. I had never seen this piece of information. My point is you can access the other side for anyone because they're still there. Everybody who ever exists, just like everything that's in your brain is still there. <laughs> I know this sounds weird, but everyone who's ever been on this planet is still accessible. They may have reincarnated, they may be doing something else, they may be whatever they're doing. But if you get to, to the right people and get to the right questions, you can ask them anything. You can ask them stuff about how to save the planet. You can ask them, how do we change the energy pattern on the Earth? How do we stop using fossil fuels? How do we find a new science to talk about what people having near-death experiences are having? My wife did a, a class recently where she took a photograph of her boss, and it was like a class in the ESP. And they handed photographs around and randomly got to someone, and the teacher got my wife's photograph of her attorney boss. And the teacher was very specific about how he died and where, where he was and how he was following his wife around when she jogged and talked about the actual location of where that was. And the teacher asked him, why are you coming through so clearly? And he said, because the veil is thinning. Now, he didn't say it as a spiritual statement. He wasn't trying to impress anyone in the class. It was a statement of fact, I think. I've heard it more and more. The veil is thinning. The girl that I had asked those three questions, 
Did I tell you what those three questions were? Did we answer, like, what is the meaning of the shift? No, we didn't. All right, so I'm going to finish with that. Let's go back to that girl. Remember the sarcastic one who asked the questions, is the universe, it's a machine, however, it's sentient? Well, the second question is, what's the meaning of the shift? And her spirit guide, or this older fellow up there in a library, says, oh, you humans, you feel the need to name things as if you're going to get a better handle on it. So you call it the shift. I thought, oh, that's weird. <laughs> Spirit guy's mocking earthlings. What's that about? He said, we don't call it that over here, the shift. We call it the quickening. What does that mean? Things moving at a different rate. But he called it the quickening. He said, listen, in terms of the cosmos, the shift on the earth, not a big deal. Of course, I love people who use a reference for, like, you know, planets running into each other. He said, however, if you want to understand a shift in consciousness, consider this. Imagine yourself a crab walking on the ocean floor, and you open your eyes and realize you're in an ocean. That's a shift in consciousness. Wow. Cool. Then the question, so what or who is God? And he said, look, God is beyond... The capacity of the human brain to comprehend, it's just not physically possible. And I thought, oh, he's ducking it. He's ducking the question. He said, however, you can experience God. And I was just talking to somebody how I, was, I met a bushman who had never been in a pool of water, never been in a pool. And I was trying to describe what a, diving into a pool was like. It's like, you can't, you know, it's wet, you're floating. He's looking at me like, what? You can experience it, and then you know it. You can experience God, okay? How's that? You can experience God by opening your heart to everyone and to all things. Unconditional love is what God is. So you want to experience God? Open your heart to everyone and to all things, including me. Thank you very much.